Hello, I'm Sarah. Welcome to the first spinning video uh, from my yarn lab to you of 2024. I've got my Ashford Kiwi 2 spinning wheel here. I've got a project for another day sitting in the background. Uh, we'll talk more about that in another future video when it's ready to go. And I've got a mostly full bobbin already on my Ashford Kiwi. Uh, and this is the yarn that I'm going to spin with you today, uh, talk about, we're going to blend some fiber and see where we end up. I've got a project in mind already, so let's dive right into it. So this is the fiber I'm using today. Well, actually, it's only some of the fiber I'm using today. Uh, I'm going to hold off on this blue and green. I'm going to hold off on this white. And I think that this, although it's an absolutely stunning little strip of fiber here, but I think by itself, it just doesn't blend with what I've already got on my bobbin. I am going to spin these two up today. And they really more accurately capture um, the project and the color tone, color story that I have in mind here. Um, and I should say that all of these bumps of fiber came in that bag together as Malabrigo cloud tails. So I'm not entirely sure if these are factory ends, um, if they are one off or mist dyes that they then split up and bundle together um, sort of in, in a bag. <laughs> but whatever they are, they're absolutely beautiful. Uh, Malabrigo, of course, has lovely colors, stunningly soft fiber. Uh, when I very first started spinning, back in those old 2015 um, Yarn Lab YouTube videos. And today I just wanted to look at a couple different ways that you can spin a single using commercially prepared roving, which I've dyed here at home. I spun a couple of Malabrigo braids back then. Uh, they were, I think, one of the first, um, I don't know if you would call them indie dyers anymore, but at the time they were one of the first dyers, dye studios, to start producing easily accessible spinning fibers. Uh, today it's obviously much more common. You go to um, yarn shows and you'll almost always find spinning fiber. But back then, if you were in a local yarn shop and they had um, braids of comb top available for spinners, uh, more likely than not, it was the Malabrigo fiber. So that's where I started. Uh, we're kind of coming full circle in that I'm spinning some of it here today. And like I said, this is the Cloud Tails. It was a bag of multiple different colors. And I've just been spinning them onto my wheel uh, in the order in which I pull them out of the bag to create a single that I am likely going to ply. And I started this spinning project ooh, probably just after Christmas. I did talk about it a little bit in my last lab report video. Uh, and it is inspired by some of the design work and spinning that Andrea Mowry has done. So let's just get my wheel going so we can spin while we chat. So Andrea Mowry, uh, of course, spectacular knitwear designer in her own right, has over the last few years really gotten into spinning her own fibers and more recently as a result of that, has begun designing projects intended for, or at least designing them with, her hand spun fiber. Uh, her last two designs that would sort of fit this category have been the Traveler's Shawl, Traveler Shawl and the Traveler Cowl. And I will pop those pictures up. Uh, the shawl came out first and then the cowl is a more recent addition. And when I purchased this bag of fiber, I did actually have that Traveler's Shawl in mind because I believe when she spun for it she did a combo spin so she pulled a couple maybe three different braids of fiber and then um, spun and plied those together to create a unique and interesting yarn um, so this is not really is it a combo spin is it not I think that that's sort of a term that you can use however you please when I've seen people talk about combo spins in the past, it's been more in the context of, say, taking two distinct braids, blending them together on like a drum carter, and then spinning the resultant bat on the wheel. Whereas 
I think just plying two unique braids together, for me that's not really a combo spin. And honestly, why limit yourself at just two braids? Uh, we'll see that when I blend up fiber for the second bobbin uh, for this yarn, what I'm going to apply this with. So I've got the ball band, if you will, the information from the bag. Um, these Malabrigo cloud tails are, um, so it's funny the way that we use words interchangeably. So they're listed as roving 250 grams, but then also single lot combed top. So they're definitely a top, not a roving, but uh, colloquially those two words tend to get interchanged a lot. Um, but by top, what that means is that the fiber appears to have been um, potentially pin drafted or combed so that all of the fibers in this prep are aligned in parallel in the same direction um, to facilitate worsted style spinning. Uh, I am using sort of my default spinning technique, which is not a true worsted or a true woolen. Um, a true worsted would be more of a short forward draft, not letting any twist come into the fiber in my uh, drafting hand. Whereas a woolen spin, you know, is usually a long backwards draft, letting that twist really do all the work for you. And my preferred spinning method for my default yarn is sort of a, a mismatch of the two that makes for a really smooth and quick drafting style. If you're interested in a talk a little bit more about enjoying and appreciate your default yarn, the yarn that I used in the color work of this sweater, which is the Sheep Camp sweater designed by Jennifer Berg, um, this yarn here is from a video in which I spin my default yarn. I embrace my default spinning style. I will link that in the description below. But for these singles, I am just doing that same thing. My default, uh, not quite woolen, not quite worsted spinning style. The nice thing about this spinning style is it's just going to allow your hands to do the same thing and the characteristic of the resultant single or the resultant yarn to be dictated by the fiber prep. So because this is a combed top with all those individual fibers aligned in parallel, this spinning style is feeding them into the single in a fashion that is keeping them more or less still in parallel alignment, which is making an overall worsted style single. As for color management with this top, uh, all of the pieces that I've selected to include in this yarn have been sort of modeled with uh, sometimes quite intense sections of color on the outside of the fiber, but even this intense section here, when you flip it or open it up to the inside, you can see that there is a much less intensely dyed area on the inside sometimes right to white sections inside the fiber. So it's kind of like they applied the dye and it dyed the surface of the top, but didn't really penetrate into the core of the top. And you can see that potentially if you look straight down the, you know, if you look straight into the top, you can see that that intense color is around the outside and you've got more white or undyed fibers on the inside. And if we look closely at my bobbin, you can see that that results in a lot of barber pulling in the singles that I'm spinning. And I'm not doing any color management. So you could see, for instance, in this section, if I really wanted to, I could split the pink away from the blue. I could collect it with a pink section from over here. I could try to keep um, more yellow sections together. I could divvy up these strips of top to do intentional color management. I'm not doing that. I haven't split them or stripped them. I'm quite simply just working my way back and forth across the width of the top as I work down the length of it. And in doing so, that's going to give me sort of bigger blotches of color in my resultant singles yarn that I think will be well suited to that traveler design uh, that Andrea Mowry has created. If you look at her samples, you can see that you get large blotches, large areas of color before moving on, transitioning to the next. Um, 
hopefully my dog barking outside isn't too loud here. You can see those large sections of color transitioning from one into another. I'm kind of aiming for that by spinning in this manner. Um, it's also somewhat but not completely reminiscent of a spin cycle dyed in the wool type yarn. Um, but mine certainly seems to have a lot of barber pulling and I think that it's going to produce a very interesting characteristic to the overall yarn. It's certainly quite beautiful on the bobbin. Each one of these strips of fiber is about 15 to 20 grams and there was 250 grams total in that bag and I should clarify that it is 100% superwash treated uh, merino fiber which if you're new to spinning I would probably stay away from a 100% superwash merino fiber uh, especially in a combed top preparation like this so I know that I did say that when I learned to spin, I initially had some braids of dyed Malabrigo 100% superwash merino wool combed top uh, that I learned on. And it's not actually a fiber that I would recommend for totally beginner um, spinners because I find that fine wools like merino, especially when they're superwash treated, and especially when they're in a combed top type preparation with those aligned fibers can be really slick in your hands. So it's very easy for your drafting to slip through your fingers and get ahead of you and for you to break your singles. Um, I think that's something that is much grippier, a little bit uh, rougher, not rough, but something that's much grippier, much toothier than a superwash treated yarn uh, is a better starting place for new spinners. But once you have the hang of it, this is really, it's like drafting a cloud. Um, it's lovely on your hands. It's really a lovely spinning experience. Uh, I can't recommend uh, Malabrigo's comb tops. You know, can't recommend it enough. Colors are stunning, they seem to be fairly color fast, and the fiber is just super yummy. So, I'm just gonna go ahead and finish spinning this strip, and finish spinning that last one. I'm fairly certain that I shouldn't have any issue fitting both of those onto my uh, bobbin here, and then it will be time to consider what fibers I'm going to blend and how I'm going to use my drum carter, which is, you know, normally used to create a more woolen style bat, to prepare my fiber in a way that will allow for my second single that I'll ply this with to have similar characteristics. Although I'm sure you could certainly ply a woolen single with a worsted single and get something very unique and interesting, uh, that's not the look or the experiment that I'm interested in doing today. I do want to see if I could create off my drum carter something that maintains those parallel fiber alignments for a more worsted style yarn that will match this absolutely beautiful Malabrigo combed top uh, that I'll have for my first single. So I'll finish up the spinning and I'll get my drum carter and my fiber stash out and I will meet you upstairs at my table. So I've got my drum carter set up. I've got the cloud tails that I chose not to use, as well as the last cloud tail that I haven't spun yet that I'm going to spin. I'm keeping this one up here as inspiration because it is probably representative of the whole of the collection of cloud tails that I spun into that single. So this is my color palette that my second single needs to ply with. And this shows you really clearly how you have sort of color around the outside of the fiber, but a lot of white in the core or the center of the fiber. So um, with that in mind, I probably want to be fairly heavy handed with white. Luckily there was one undyed cloud tail um, in that bag. And like I said, this is just 100% um, superwash treated merino fiber. So with this, I'm going to also use some oops, Knit Picks Swish Unspun Roving. 
And this is also just 100% super fine merino wool. This is not, well it is, it says machine washable. So this is super wash treated as well. So, um, and it looks and feels, you know, almost identical to the fiber that Malabrigo is using. So, um, heavy with white. Uh, these are, like I said, those three colored ones that I chose not to use because they didn't feature enough white. Um, but I can break them up into this for my second single. And then I have a bin of my spinning fiber stash. Um, this is not all of it, but I feel like there's almost definitely enough in here to complement this pile of fiber to make bats with. So I'm going to go through my bin and pull things that I like and then divide them all in half because I'm going to make two bats. Uh, I can very comfortably, I can comfortably fit a 50 gram bat on this drum carter. Um, I should say this is a Louette drum carter that I picked up secondhand a couple years ago and it has served me incredibly well. Uh, I can comfortably fit about 50 grams on here. I can, not too difficultly, I can, without too much difficulty, get a solid 80 grams on here, and I think 160 grams will be plenty to ply off against what I have in my bobbin. And don't mind, there's laundry on my table too. I'm going to start by dividing each of these roughly in half, one for each yarn. And I'll divide this one in half, uh, but I won't break this one up. I'll add this to my drum carter as I go along. So there's fiber for my two bats. Here is my inspiration piece. So I've got sort of this color palette in here. I've got the blues in here, and I've got obviously the greens in here. What I am short on are the pinks and purples uh, and maybe a little bit of a true yellow. So let's take these out because these are actually intended for specific spins. And I will get into this bag of sea turtle fiber arts. I think this will be perfect actually. Uh, I last used this fiber to um, make thrummed mittens with. I'll grab those, show you how they're holding up. Here's those thrum mittens, and you can see why you probably shouldn't use superwash treated because you want your thrums to felt in, not necessarily pill out of your mittens. Um, but they depill pretty easily, and they make for a super cozy interior of the mitten. Little tangent for you this is the double dutch, uh, doubly dutch. Uh, classic convertible thrum mitten. I'll link it in the description below. Uh, was a great project. So, Sea Turtle Fiber Arts, um, I think it's going to give me most, maybe not all, but most of what I need to finish out this yarn. So I've got the hot pink here. Um, might just go a small portion of each. Uh, the big difference between, say, this hot pink and the Malabrigo colors that I'm using is that there's a lot of variation to this blue, whereas this hot pink is a solid. So I don't want as much, um, I want a lot of variability in this, this single. Uh, I'm gonna put a tiny bit of the neon green. And a good chunk of the purple. And probably that's it from this bag. Um, this is a fairly certain Corydale, um, just solid dyed. Don't think there's a place for more hot pink, but I am going to put some of this gray in just to add a little bit of moodiness. If you look, like there is some moodiness and I need to get something in this sort of real deep burgundy kind of place as well. Right. Oh, 
The other really important thing to note is I'm not going to use any roving. So this is carded roving. And you can see that the fibers, hopefully you can tell that the fibers are going every which way in this fiber. Whereas everything that I've been grabbing so far is combed top. So you can see um, these fibers, all of the fibers have that parallel arrangement. Whereas this, uh, everything is crisscrossing sort of more every which way. There is still sort of a general direction to roving, but it's much more disorganized. It's sort of like, you know, if everybody was crisscrossing back and forth, but the whole group was moving in a direction, whereas this is everybody marching side by side in a direction. So, woolen, worsted. Not using any woolen pumps. Hmm, I've got this bag of hedgehog fibers. This was a club colorway from years ago, but it's not 100% merino. It's half camel, half wool. I'll leave it. But this, you know, some of these sections would play nicely in there. Might put just a teeny tiny bit of black in too. I'll just split that in half. Just a teeny tiny bit of the black. Do I have anything in that burgundy sort of place? Not really. A little pop of this orange. This is how it happens, friends. Um, I just dive in, root around. I'm just gonna keep my inspiration in front of me. I'm gonna look at my inspiration. I'm gonna look at my piles and see if this is telling the same color story as this. And remember, I am gonna add in a whole lot more white uh, than what I just have here. I think this is a pretty good starting place. So I think this is a pretty good starting place. I will get started with one. And anything that's not in the matching pile over here that I end up adding to this one, I will add to my matching pile as well. Hopefully we're making sense. Inspiration, um, fiber pull to try and create a similar, but different, but something that will play well with what I've got here and on my bobbin already. All right, so um, again, important. I have combed top, everything going in the same direction. With a drum carter, there's more than one way that you can actually load fiber on. If you want to create a bat that is really quite woolen style, fiber is going every which way, you can spread your fiber out, lay it down here, um, perpendicular to the direction of the drum carter, and then suck it in. And that's gonna really open things up and spread it out in a disorganized manner into your bat. If I was using locks from fleece and I really wanted to open my fiber up with my drum carter, I would feed in down here. If I paint onto my drum carter, which is what you often see uh, fiber artists doing, which is not using the liquor in, just painting directly onto the drum, and I keep my fiber going parallel to the direction that my drum carter is spinning, I can maintain a lot of that parallel orientation of my fibers for a worsted style yarn. And that's what I'm gonna do. So, um, and like I said, sometimes people call this painting onto your drum carter. And I'm just gonna start pulling colors randomly. I'm not worried about these bats being identical because my original single that they're gonna be plied against was obviously here's one strip, here's another strip, here's another strip. So bats don't need to be identical. They need to be siblings, not twins, right? And just trying to focus on keeping things as worsted, as parallel as I can. And you know what I might also try and do? 
because I have blotches of color, I'm not going to evenly distribute this gray. I know that's what I started doing, but from here on out, I'm not going to evenly distribute the color across the drum. I'm gonna put it on blotchy. So there's a big blotch of gray there. And I'm going to sandwich, because I want all of my colors to play with the white fiber. I'm going to sandwich some white fiber into there. And then I will blotch a little bit of that gold on with maybe a little bit of the pink. And then maybe put a good blotch of pink over here. And I'm just going to try and continuously visualize what I want my finished single to look like be sort of different, difficult to explain, but that's what I'm visualizing. You know, and like you saw, my colors were really barber pulling together, um, a light with a dark. So that's what we're going with in loading up my drum. So I'm going to use up that white real quickly, better grab that additional nitpick swish that I have. Because we're going to be heavy on the white. So as your drum starts to get full, um, loading on takes a good grip on your fiber. Watch your knuckles. It's easy to slip and hit your knuckles on the cardigan ball. And you want to sort of lay it with some downwards pressure or against the pressure of the drum to get it to pack deep into those teeth. All right, now it's time to remove it from the drum. So my bat is ready to come off the drum carter and I'm gonna try something I've never done before. I picked up this um, stone at a gift shop uh, at a recent visit out to Banff in Alberta. It's just a flat stone with a hole through the middle. I think it's meant to be worn like as a bead on a pendant, but I saw it and thought it could be a beautiful whorl for a spindle or that I might be able to use it as a diz. Um, so you can actually pull a roving off of a drum carter. In theory, I've never done it before. Um, using a diz, which is just a, you know, a spinner's way of saying a piece of something firm with a hole in it. So we're gonna see if it works. And if it doesn't, then I will just pull it off like a bat and we will strip it down and spin it that way. 
but I would love to be able to get a roving off of here. So I'm just using uh, a crochet hook because I don't have the actual dopper tool for opening up a bat to get my fiber started. Hopefully this is clear and then I'm going to twist a little point and shove it through that hole in my diz. And then I believe the idea is sort of draft up, pull through, draft up, pull through, draft up, pull through. And you want to keep it relatively close to the teeth. And the idea is that you get a long, hopefully continuous strip of roving off of this. Uh, the traditional context for using a diz is with a hackle with comb fiber that way to pull a roving, but you can do it from a drum carter. This probably would have worked a lot better if I didn't have quite so much fiber on here. But you can see I'm getting a lovely, uh, rather sick, because like I said, I packed this super full, roving that has all of these colors. I can tell you already that this yarn is definitely going to be more muddied and mottled and less splotchy. But we are where we are and let's go with that. We're just pulling too much fiber for this wee little hole. Hmm. So if I were to do this again, I would not have my drum quite nearly as full as this because we are pulling quite a bit of fiber through starting to go now. So now I just need to I've come back to my starting point to scooch it that way a little bit. Yeah, and with less fiber coming through that hole, so much easier to do this. Yeah, much easier now. Um, I wish that Again, because it's so full, it's catching a bit on the liquor in, which is pulling things up. So it's getting a little bit disorganized. Yeah, so we broke, but I've got a good seven feet probably of a continuous roving here. So that's what I pulled off so far. I'm gonna pull the rest off. Is this any better or different than if I just pulled the whole bat off and then stripped it down? Probably not. But trying new things, fun, right? So here's the first part that I pulled off with that Diz. Here's the second part. And for comparison, here's the fiber that I would like them to play nicely with. And I do think that I've achieved that. I've achieved that. Um, certainly I think the color distribution is going to be more modeled coming off my drum carter, but I think that these will two ply together no problem at all. Um, I'm just going to repeat that process exactly for the second one and then touch back in with you. All right, it's the next day now. I have finished that first bobbin of the Malabrigo Cloudtails singles. Uh, I've got some of that roving that I dizzed off my drum carter. And I've actually spun up two bumps like this. And just taking a look at how full my bobbin is already, I think we've only got room for one bump left. So I'm gonna kind of look, I think we'll go with this one here. Um, yeah, so let me take you for a close up of what's on my bobbin so far, compare it to that previous bobbin of singles and uh, get spinning. So this is the first bobbin, the Malabrigo Cloudspun Singles, and this is the one that I'm currently working on of the fiber that I blended in order to kind of harmonize nicely with this. Uh, and you can see, I think that they are going to apply together 
really quite beautifully. Uh, there are some areas that are certainly more saturated color in the new singles compared to a little bit of a more pastel-y overall feel in the old singles, but I think once they're applied together, things are going to be quite, quite nice together. So let's talk about how I've been spinning this roving that I made myself. Uh, as you can see, it is certainly not as organized in a parallel fashion as the commercial roving was, or that commercial, sorry, combed top was, but since I used all combed top to prep this, and I showed you that in that carding portion of the video, things are still generally aligned uh, in a parallel directions for me to spin worsted onto the wheel. Now, with the commercial top, I was able to keep the top intact and just spin back and forth across the fiber. What I have found, and I'll see if it'll demonstrate a little bit, with this blended fiber, when I tried to do that, I have found that I end up pulling sort of a whole white section out and then a whole black section out and then a whole gold section out and getting solid chunks of color rather than the barber pulling that I want. And so rather than spin from the full width of the fiber like this, what I have been doing is pulling off uh, like about a 6 to 12 inch section of fiber and then pre-drafting my fiber out. And I really do recommend pre-drafting for anyone who's having difficulty drafting as you spin, whether that's difficulty in maintaining consistent thickness in your yarn, whether it's difficulty in maintaining the color management that you want in your yarn. And hopefully you can see, I'm just very carefully and gently pre-drafting, attenuating how many fibers I'm working with at a time, trying to pull equally from the whole width of this fiber so that my color distribution um, remains the same, but sort of di dilutes out because you're not gonna be able to pull a thick chunk of blue. You're gonna be pulling from sort of that section of fibers. So I've just been taking that section like that, pre-drafting things out, And then you can bundle it up, but I just sort of loop it onto my lap. And you can pre-draft even further, but this has been sufficient for me. So with this pre-drafted section now, I'm able to spin with my default spinning style, keeping those fibers oriented in parallel as they join, you know, as they accumulate twist and head onto my bobbin. And now I get the barber pulling of the white with the colors and I don't get long um, you know long homogeneous blips of blue and then a long homogeneous blip of gold and a long homogeneous blip of white what I get is uh, blending and barber pulling and modeling of my colors which is going to result in my singles being more similar to my initial uh, dyed top. And it might feel like it's an extra step to go ahead and pre-draft out your fibers, but you'll find that with the pre-drafted fiber, you're then able to spin a lot faster. Um, and so it's sort of, you know, one of these things where you do a little bit more work up front in order to save yourself time uh, down the road. And from this angle, you can kind of see my default spinning style. Um, when you're working with pre-drafted fiber like this, you almost don't have to do any active drafting in the spinning. I'm just using my forward hand, my left hand in this case, to guide the fibers together. And I can apply a tiny bit of pressure on and off with my thumb in order to... Um, in order to pause and allow more twist to accumulate up here and more drafting to happen back here or to release that twist into the drafting zone. And you can see I kind of get a teeny weeny drafting triangle right here. And it just, I don't know where I came up with this default spinning style, but this is 
one of my favorite, most relaxing ways to spin yarn. And it produces a lovely, uh, in this case, because my fiber is, you know, aligned in as parallel as I can fashion, it produces a lovely worsted style yarn without having to do those short forward drafts. So I've got two full bobbins and I'm ready to start plying my yarn. This is bobbin number one and these were those uh, Malabrigo cloud tails. This is bobbin number two and this is the fiber that I blended on my drum carter and pulled through a diz. I did only use uh, three out of the four strips of roving that I pulled off um, so I will put this back into my yarn stash to save for another day. Uh, plus it'll come handy if in a pinch I don't have enough of my second single to ply against the first. I can always spin a little bit more. And despite being commercially prepared and the fiber that I prepared on my drum carter, I think that these two singles are going to ply together beautifully and you won't be able to tell that these weren't the same prep in the first place. So I won't bore you for ages by videotaping the entire process of plying these two bobbins. Um, Plying up is usually much, much faster than spinning, uh, but I still expect it to take me probably an hour and a half or so um, to ply up all this yarn. And I am just plying uh, right off the built-in Lazy Kate of my spinning wheel, guiding my yarns up with my right hand, and controlling the angle at which they ply together with my left hand. And I will say when I ply, I do like to periodically do a test for whether I'm over plying or under plying. So if you are over or under plying with either too much or too little twist, if you went to do a ply back, it would hypercoil um, and twist up on itself. <laughs> and if it's hanging limp when you release the tension in your plied yarn, then you know things are relatively balanced. So um, I just periodically check, get into a good rid rhythm, and away I go. The other thing that I watch out for as I am plying is that I want to move my guide on my flyer quite frequently. If you have a hook flyer, that means moving from hook to hook quite frequently so that you try to the best of your ability to fill up your bobbin evenly. And that's gonna get your yarn packed onto that bobbin as tightly as possible um, so that you can get the most yardage onto that bobbin. Uh, as it stands, looking at the fullness of my two bobbins here, I expect to fill two full bobbins and maybe even go on to a third one um, in plying up these singles. So, away I go. Here's the two bobbins of the plied yarn. Uh, this one came off first, this one came off second. This is what I have left of the singles. This is actually from the cloud tails and not from the bats that I spun. So I likely spun my cloud tails a little bit thinner overall than I did my um, bat fiber, which makes sense. This was always gonna be a little bit more perfectly worsted and consistent um, just because the nature of the fiber prep was more worsted and consistent. I'm going to wind these off onto a nitty knotty, set this twist, and uh, see what kind of yardage I have. So I'm giving a hard finish to my yarn. I've got this sink with as hot of water as my tap could do. This sink's got cold. I've got soak uh, celebration uh, wool wash in the hot water, and I know it's going to seem like the opposite of what you're supposed to do with wool, but I'm going from hot to cold and agitating <laughs> and there's soap. Everything you're not supposed to do uh, with yarn to avoid felting it, I'm going to do on purpose. Now, I know this yarn is mostly superwash treated fiber, but this is the exact same thing that I would have done with a non-superwash wool as well. This is almost 
how I always finish my hand spun yarn. Uh, the only time I wouldn't use this method would be with an art yarn uh, in which you want to preserve, you know, your structures that you've spun into the yarn. I probably wouldn't do this with a um, very lightly spun, like a lopy style Icelandic single, like a, a thick, like a thick low twist single. I wouldn't do this, but for most yarns, I like to give this kind of a hard finish to. And what it does, in my opinion, is it encourages a little bit of felting, but that felting seems to happen between the plies and within the strand of yarn itself and not so much across the skein. So you're not likely to felt one strand of yarn to the next one, but you are going to create a bond within that strand of yarn. Let me talk with my hands here. Squeeze the hot off into the cold. And then squeeze the cold off. And go back into the hot. my two skeins of finished yarn. Uh, I will open them up for you to see just how beautiful they are. They do actually look kind of like two totally distinct skeins of yarn. Looks like all of the light colors were on sort of the um, first half of the bobbins and the darker colors were on the second half. So this one came off first when I was plying, this one came off second. But um, they will still but they should still knit together nicely, especially if I knit them in order. That's uh, a totally squishy, soft, delightful bit of spinning hand spun yarn here. It's maybe a touch underplied, quite honestly, but I don't think that'll be too big of a problem. And I have in total 650 yards, approximately, um, of yarn here. So not really enough to knit the shawl. You know, I think I forget sometimes how big some of these shawl projects really are. I think I need closer to about a thousand yards in order to knit the full size shawl, which, you know, by then you're getting right up into a sweater spin. So I'll knit the cowl with this and I think I'm going to go ahead and cast on right away. I'm traveling next week and uh, this cowl project will be a really simple, um, you know, you're not managing yarns or colors, just cast on and knit really simple project to take with me while I'm traveling. So hopefully I will have this in time for some spring wear in March. Anywho, uh, I hope that this video was interesting and enjoyable to you. And I'm looking forward to lots more good spinning content here on my YouTube channel this year. Uh, if you are following me, you may have noticed that I've also been posting some spinning shorts to the YouTube shorts. That's like their version of TikTok. Um, and I've been really enjoying that. It's kind of a very quick and fun way to get just some quick nuggets of hand spinning information out there. So if you have any questions that you have about spinning, knitting, fiber, anything that you think I might have an answer for you, drop those in the comment section below. Um, and I'm happy to answer them in a shorts format here on my channel. That's all I've got for now. Happy spinning, happy experimenting with fiber, because after all, this is the Yarn Lab. Bye for now.